Um, so today we're going to be talking about duration models. So um, hopefully you're going to get through all this material. You may have to take a quick pause I'm in the middle of this. So duration models is kind of a very high level uh, description for what we're going to be studying. We're going to kind of cover a bunch of topics. I'm not going to go too in depth, but there's some really interesting stuff here. And I'm hopefully going to give you enough intuition that you're going to be able to think about um, exploring these topics on your own. And um, we will touch on, I think, some, some of the issues. I'm going to try and clarify them so that when you face them yourselves, you're not kind of viewing this as kind of a black box or magic that they sort of say, okay, this is just like any other setting um, where we're making parametric assumptions or needing to make additional assumptions, and we'll go from there. So let me start by just saying, okay, the first question when I talk about a duration model is, you know, what's a duration model? And you say, like, you know, when somebody says that, what do they mean or what are they kind of worrying about as a problem? Why do we care? Why do we need to model um, these types of these types of settings any more specially than we do um, sort of any other data setting. So what's special about duration rather than say income or something else? Um, and then third is going to be what are ways to estimate them? What are estimates that are identified in these settings? What can we do to kind of um, make things more estimated? Um, excuse me, more identified. So um, let's start <clears throat> with what's a duration model. So a duration model is just what it sounds like, a model relating to the duration of an event. And, you know, the question is, is why would we need a special model for this? You know, us, um, is there anything particularly special about this? Well, one issue is that measuring durations accurately is kind of challenging for reasons um, that we'll get into. But it's kind of a, something a little bit special about measuring durations, especially for the economic durations that we're interested in. Purely from a, um, a sampling standpoint, they, there are sort of more special things associated with them, and uh, they're obviously very relevant for the um, economic problems that we're interested in. And so that's going to already create a sort of a new set of um, problems, or not a new per se, but a set of problems that are kind of um, very specific in this setting. And then the second is that estimation... Um, particularly the kind of we have a lot of theoretical models that we are interested in and um, they're kind of the types of models that we need to do potentially require us to be a little more sophisticated than we generally would be say with just doing OLS. Um, so first let's start by talking about what's special about durations. So you know I'm going to just give you a running example throughout this in part because this is just work that I'm, I'm working on right now with Sonia Gilbuck where just as a running example, you could think about the duration of tenure in a house as kind of how long somebody's living in a place. That's a duration problem, right? So you say, okay, well, how long does a person live in their home? You know, we can just denote that as YI. That's a duration outcome, or it's the length of time. You know, if we have better data, we could even think about the duration of time that a person lives in a house for a given spell. So you know, think about your own uh, life over time, you could say, well, this person I, and they've lived in house one, they had a spell there, and then that ended, and then they moved to a new house, that's spell two, etc. So that's like a panel um, in which you could have multiple spells and you're um, watching people over time. And there are a number of notable things that could affect this tenure, right? So the age of an individual, the housing cycle, sort of how, how much of a boom in house prices there are, or et cetera. The business cycle, which is sort of things like how the economy is doing, maybe when the economy is running really hot, I'm more likely to change jobs because there'll be um, more opportunities for me to move um, or vice versa. Whether or not you're a homeowner could potentially affect it, right? So if you're a renter, you're potentially much more likely to change homes. And I'll just kind of try and refer to this example in a number of things I'm going um, to look at will kind of relate to this. But that's a useful thing to kind of keep in your mind when I talk about the maths, just think about you know, how long I live um, in a house. So you know, the types of duration data that you're going to observe are potentially going to vary a lot. And this is going to be a, play a big role in the way that I'm going to think of and talk about duration data of why it ends up mattering so much. And so, um, you know, the truth, if we could, if we were God and we saw everything, the truth would be for every person I, we observe a duration, which is, you know, between zero you know, you can't have a negative duration length and some positive maximal value. So in theory, that could be unbounded, but maybe that's maximally bounded if it's something related to a human being, right? The max lifetime of a human being. So uh, what kind of data do we observe? 
So, uh, you know, the first example is the best case scenario where we see everything. So for a given observation, we see when the spell starts and when the spell ends. So period zero all the way to cap T. So we can call this the full case um, when we see everything. Let me just quickly make sure. Okay, I want to. Okay, I'm recording. Sorry, just making sure that this works. Um, so that's uh, the simple case where we see everything. You know, sometimes we don't see everything. So there could be sampling costs or limitations on time. So an obvious thing, right, would be like you have this data, you've collected a bunch of it, and then you decide to write the paper. Well, it's possible that, you know, the last time that people bought houses, they haven't moved since then. And so you still need to write your paper. And so that's going to create what's called a, a form of right censoring, right? So for a given observation, we see the spell start, and we see the spell end for a lot of individuals or most individuals who for all people observed before some censoring point. So that can be C if it's the same for everyone or CI if it varies by individuals. And for those who have not had their spell end by the censoring point, we only observe the censoring time period. So if this censoring is effectively random, if it's not driven by something that relates to their duration um, period, then we, this is parametrically um, addressable. So um, you know, so this is something that you can deal with, but really the way to think about it is, right, we have some start period, zero, and then for we kind of, for all people, um, we're basically, you can't go any further than CI, and so we're not going to know the outcome of the people all the way up to the maximum. There's this missing period where we're going to see the, um, the minimum between what the true outcome was where they would have done it and C. So if they were before CI, then we would observe the true value, and if you know, it was censored, then we only see the censored value. So that's a right censoring problem. Sometimes we even actually have less data than this. So that was kind of nice, right, in the sense that we knew um, kind of when, when they, when, conditional on not being censored, we saw a lot of data. But sometimes we don't know, right? So there could be a version of this where we say, all right, well, what we know is we know when they start, and then we check in on them. We say, let's go along, and then we're going to check in after 10 years, and all we'll really know is whether or not um, they exited before that. So that's like basically checking in on them afterwards, and the problem is, is that you may, um, you may not know. So like it's a random thing, it could, be, it could be different for every individual, but the problem is, is that you just see whether or not they exited. You don't know what time they exited. So you have some data, there's a binary thing, right? But it doesn't give you um, full information in the same way that the previous example did. That is still addressable. I mean, you just have less data, right? So you can think about the, the shape of whatever distribution we're going to get to is kind of less well known, but you still have information. Um, that's something you can also deal with parametrically. The, the cases I've described so far are kind of what we, um, what we would call flow sampling, though, so far. So, so far, what we've seen is that we've observed when the start of the duration begins. You know, we begin, we see the flow. We're going we're gonna to watch as it goes along. And then the alternative sampling procedure you could imagine draws from the stock of individuals. So this is what's called, you know, stock sampling. And so what this would do is what you'd say is, all right, I'm going to come in and I'm just going to see all the people um, who are in a home right now and I'm going, to, I'm going to basically view it. So in the case of housing, it's easy because people are always in a house, right? So you're just going to come in and observe it and for those people, you're going to observe the stock. But one could imagine this is going to be more problematic in the case of um, unemployment because you're going to see the stock of the unemployed and there's going to be sort of selection into the groups of individuals uh, who are there. Not everyone is unemployed. And so coming in and, and sampling from the stock is going to potentially create issues. Now, if you observe how long the duration lasted at the time of sampling, so if you basically come in and you sample individuals and you say, all right, well, when did you um, start to live in this home? Then it's not really a problem, right? All we, all we really need to account for is the... Um, sample selection that occurs from the stock sampling, right? So if you come in and you sample people, you're going to potentially getting differential sampling procedure than you would if 
you basically just observe every person when they buy. If you're sampling, the way that you draw your data looks different, that's gonna create um, a different uh, approach. A simple way to think of this is that, for example, if I just track every transaction that occurs or every um, housing change that happens, that's a flow sampling procedure. But if I take the census and I come in and I just sample everyone right at this time period, that's a stock sampling procedure where I've asked everyone um, where, how long have they been living somewhere. Those are different ways of seeing what's going on in the data. Um, these are just different with those you can account for them if you don't have if as long as you know what the start time is if you don't observe the start time that creates a version of left censoring so left censoring is not something we're going to talk about here in the but it just creates this much bigger problem in the sense that you know you have to make more assumptions about the process of when people come in in order to account for this fact that we didn't see kind of the initial part of the problem so we're going to be really focusing on either you see everything or you've got some sort of right censoring problem and what goes on. And um, that kind of hopefully makes sense in, in a lot of settings. That, that's just there's a much bigger problem of selection into the sample when you have a left censoring problem. So kind of the point here, though, that I just want to reflect on is that, you know, when you do flow versus stock sampling, it's really easy when you have flow sampling and you have no censoring, right? So then you don't have to make any adjustments. There's no sort of sampling issue. When, when and basically, and we're going to talk through this, but what I, you basically have is that in, if you've right censored, um, you need to make an adjustment for thinking about uh, your data sampling process. That makes sense. You're basically top coded. Indicator, you also need to adjust for this if you're thinking about the underlying distribution. When you do stock sampling, all of those cases have to be adjusted for simply to address the fact that you're kind of selecting into a particular sample that you see. The kind of the key takeaway that I want you to understand or have about this is that understanding the sampling structure of your data is always really important. So this is particularly important with duration data. So the, the thing though is, right, is that, you know, there's nothing particularly special about censoring problems and sampling issues, data sampling issues to duration data, right? Wage data can be censored or truncated due to you know, reservation wages or survey measurement. They can be top coded, for example. Um, there are a number of different settings, right? You could imagine these types. The, the concern of thinking about the sampling is potentially going to play a role for what you're interested in. But it, it's, it's sort of first order in duration data. This is always a problem. This right censoring thing is always an issue that you have to worry about. And so as a consequence, you always need to be um, aware that this is something that's going to come up when you're when as soon as your outcome becomes I'm interested in how long someone is doing X then you should at least be immediately thinking about okay censoring is potentially going to be an issue or you know how how is the sampling occurring do I observe everyone who comes in or am I just stock sampling um, that's kind of I think I think you should think of all cases in duration data you should think of as not being special but being first order. So always sort of think about the data generating process in your data. I think there's probably econometricians who would always raise that issue. But when you do duration data, this just becomes a more of a first order problem. A more important question is, what are you interested in? You know, what's your estimate that you're interested in? So are you just interested in measuring some simple averages about the duration data? So that's sort of what I've been hinting at so far is just simple univariate statistics. Or you could be interested in kind of bivariate things like what's the effect of a treatment on the average length of a duration, the median duration, etc. So, you know, you could think about a linear regression, right, which is the time to t do something on some treatment indicator. You know, this is the kind of thing we've been studying a lot of so far. This is kind of well-defined concept when this treatment that I'm interested in is randomly assigned, but censoring would still create a problem, right? We talked about this when we were thinking about quantile regression, that, you know, when you don't see the full support for YI, um, there's potentially going to be selection problems. You're not going to, you won't inherently misestimate what beta is, um, but you're not going to get what the average treatment effect is. This is actually a very useful exercise to think about, you know, if YI is censored, and I estimate using this treatment effect on it, 
I'll get some causal effect on the sensor data, but I won't inherently be getting the true underlying average treatment effect. I'll be getting some weird version of what's measured in the data. So let's talk about an actual um, example to kind of make this really concrete because I think it becomes um, challenging uh, to just think about this in the abstract. So let's think about the length of times between housing transactions. So this is from stuff, something I'm working on, but you know, let's just think about these are coming from housing transactions where we see kind of the, the turnover of houses. You can think of this as how long is somebody staying in a home. It's not quite right because people can own multiple homes or can own investment properties. Um, the sample is something where we, you know, it was known, we basically were seeing all transactions as of um, the August 2017, right? So what I'm seeing is that the data is drawn there, but we see every transaction. So every transaction occurred, so it's flow sampling, but it's censored as of this date. So what it's going to do is create different censoring horizons depending on when the home was last bought, right? So hopefully that makes sense in the sense that you know, if you bought the home in 2016 in August, you're going to be censored at one year versus if it was uh, 2010, January, that's going to create a very different censoring amount. We can first just look at the full distribution. So, you know, you see this duration, uh, distribution of the housing duration, um, where what we're going to get is we see kind of a lot of mass um, initially, and then it kind of flattens out and it, it's not monotonic, right? There's this interesting hump here. This is actually from a 1% sample, but that's irrelevant. So that's a full distribution. You know, if we focus just on the 2010, um, these are people from who bought their home in 2010 and after, you can kind of see this very obvious truncation problem. So I'm keeping the x-axis the same. It's pretty obvious that, well, we don't observe any lengths longer than eight years for obvious reasons. Um, but the shape of this curve um, is kind of less obvious. So you see this see this sort of problem, but there's actually this mixture of all these different years, and so you kind of just look like you've chopped off one piece of it. Um, what becomes interesting now is if we start thinking about 20, 2005 and after these cohorts, we start to see this very interesting heterogeneity in there. And so part of the reason, as you might imagine, is that there's this big hump in housing transactions from the housing boom that subsequently um, look very... Uh, you know, are kind of bunching up here that haven't transacted subsequently. And what's really notable and interesting here is, right, we can start to then say, well, what does the distribution look like um, if we break this out by year? And so what's kind of interesting is that, well, this is from the 2000 to 2008 cohorts. And what we can see is that there's this, you know, obvious mass. And then we see all this bunching um, at the truncation point for each of these years. So we see this very obvious um, sample distribution in um, the transactions for each of the years. It's kind of hard to see, but there's you know very obvious um, transaction behavior. But all of them start to sort of bunch up right at the um, right at the uh, at the kind of censoring point because kind of there's all these people who are holding on to them and haven't transacted, and so we don't see the subsequent transactions. So um, the thing is, is of course as in these previous ones when we put them together, that cr kind of created these averages so you didn't see as much of the bunching, but when we break it out by year, it becomes very obvious. So, you know, in this case, can, you know, the question becomes in this setting, can we calculate the average duration, you know, without any further assumptions, right? So if we look at these graphs previously, you know, is it possible to know what is the average duration for a person? So in this case, maybe you think, you know, you have a distribution here. We see it for over a really long period of time. Maybe we can calculate the average um, duration. We don't see much bunching. And, you know, purely non-parametrically, it's not plausible that we could do it. So we have to make, we could make some additional assumptions um, if we use just the very, very old data potentially there would be so little um, censoring that there wouldn't be a problem and we could just use it within the 19, say the houses bought in 1980, we could estimate it. But we couldn't calculate the average duration for all homes bought over the whole sample because even with this random sampling, we don't know the data generating process. We don't know, for example, what's the average duration for the houses that are um, bought 
basically um, any time after the censoring point. So it could be completely unbounded. We don't have any sense of what it looks like. And so at best, from a pure non-parametric point, we can, we can really only do partial identification. And we'll talk about this later in the semester, but we could put bounds potentially if we were willing to make assumptions on like the, you know, the lifetime in which a person lives in a home has to be bounded above by the human life expectancy. And so that would help us put bounds on this. Um, but if we're willing to make more assumptions, and that's what we're going to do going forward, then yes, you could do this, right? So and hopefully intuitively it makes sense that if we were willing to make some assumptions on the structure of the data, that what we could do is kind of impute the values um, going forward, as long, but we'd have to basically use the information um, that we see in our sample plus some parametric assumptions to go forward. So, you know, one thing that it is worth talking about, though, before we get into kind of the more parametric models is that it is worth noting that there are things that we can still estimate or identify. There are estimands that we can identify even without parametric assumptions, right? So think about this is the distribute. This is that same graph I did here, this um, housing duration, the CDF or the PDF. But now I've done the CDF version. So here now, I'm, this is the duration, and what you can see is it's because my data is in months that you see this kind of um, sawtooth pattern. It would be an immediate jump if it was just in years. But basically what happens here, right, is that at nine years, um, we're censored for the 2008 data, or a little under nine years, um, 10 for this other one, et cetera, going forward. These are each purchase year. And, you know, the kind of the interesting thing is we could talk about estimates of this, right? So the 25th percentile for the 2000 year uh, purchase year is, we can talk about what is that, the 25th quartile, right? So the first quartile, and we can do that for all the years, right? So for the 2000 cohort, or excuse me, the 2008 cohort, the housing duration is much longer than all the other years. If we see, um, you know, we can look at all these other years, the this is 2008, and we can look at 2007, 2006, et cetera, and go backwards. And it's notable the the 2008 quartile is much, much longer than everyone else. That's potentially not surprising, right? If you think about what's going on is that that's really when the housing market really went sort of haywire. You're really buying at the, at the, the trough of the housing market. I mean, actually, the trough is slightly below, but... Regardless, it kind of makes sense that you would see that the 2007, 2006, those would all have longer durations, potentially because it's been harder to kind of sell your home subsequently. And so it's interesting to note, we don't have to make any assumptions to talk about shifts in the quartiles. And we can actually, for these other years, we can even talk about shifts in these quartiles for, say, the, um, the median as well, or not the median, the 40th percentile. So there's things we can still identify irrespective um, of this point about... Um, the um, needing to know what goes on subsequently. There are other estimates that we can identify. Okay, so now let's think about um, pivoting to hazard models. So what are some parametric ways that papers address these problems? So I'm gonna talk about kind of the workhorse examples. I'm gonna start with something very simple and then we'll talk about kind of the, I'll very briefly talk about the kind of the workhorse version of this. Um, just so, so that you kind of understand what's going on in these settings. Basically, duration modeling in many cases is focused on what we'll call hazard modeling. So why is that? Um, we'll talk about what a hazard is, but you know, if, you're, if you've done any economic theory, you know that the hazard is kind of what is the probability that something happens right now for someone who's waiting for it to happen. The hazard is kind of the... Um, the probability that something occurs to you instantaneously right now. The hazard rate is very, has very natural economic tie-ins um, tie to theory. So a lot of times if you're writing down a dynamic model that has these things, that's the property you're going to play around with. And the reason for that is that the, it kind of adjusts appropriately for the survival of individuals. Um, we'll talk about this again in just a second. But you know, what you want to talk about is what is the hazard of people for whom it could happen to? Right? So if we have something happening going along, there are people for whom it occurs to and they survive. Some, only some subset of them survive. We want to talk about the kind of the hazard rate that it occurs to those individuals who could, it could still happen to. This is really you know, nothing more powerful than what we've already studied. Basically, 
you know, using these parametric models, we're going to be able to account for data issues. But the whole point is that we just need more assumptions. We're going to have to assume um, more assumptions in order to uh, do this. And so, you know, don't think of this as magic. Think of this as I need more structure because my data has issues. So let me quickly um, do an aside on some formal definitions so that you, if you haven't seen this before, this will this is really just most of the terminology you'll need to know. You know, the CDF, F of Y, is the probability of a duration being no longer than Y, right? So that this is nothing special to duration modeling, but F of Y is the CDF. And so then little f of Y is the corresponding density, the probability that kind of um, happens at any one period of time, the instantaneous probability. And then we talk about the survival function as 1 minus the CDF. So it's how long does it take for you to get to some period? And then you can talk about the hazard function. Is the hazard function is the probability that happens, the unconditional probability, so that's the density, scaled by the probability of surviving until a period. So that's really kind of this point, is that it's kind of capturing this aspect of how long do you wait until you... Do you make it to this point? Well, what's the probability that it happens at this point? Conditional on surviving, you're adjusting for the survival propensity. Kind of the neat features of the hazard, right, is that so it can condition on the it conditions on the survival propensity. It's time varying. Importantly, just from a, um, an econometric standpoint, is it summarizes all the characteristics of F. If you know the hazard rate, uh, the hazard function, you also know the CDF. You know also know um, the density. These all map one to one of um, an, uh, to one another. I think the kind of key assumption here, so I wrote simplifying assumption, but I don't actually think of this as the right way to say this, is that this is a new, um, think of this as a, a useful summary measure of the CDF that's different that kind of adjusts accordingly. So don't think, it, the, simplifying assumption is the wrong word here. This should be kind of summary assumption or summarizing um, assumption. So. Let me just kind of describe, so Vandenberg has um, this description of kind of why use a hazard model. So really it's extra structure. And so he has a handbook chapter on duration modeling and he kind of talks about, well, why do you do a hazard function? So he says the hazard function is a focal model or focal point of econ econometric duration models. That is properties of the distribution of T are generally discussed in terms of properties of theta. So theta here, um, is what he's talking about as this hazard function. So theta is his hazard functions. There are two reasons for this. So first, and most importantly, this approach is dictated by economic theory. So in general, theories that aim at explaining durations focus on the rate in which a subject leaves the state at duration t, given that he has not done so yet. So that makes sense. In particular, they explain the hazard at time t in terms of external conditions at t. So that's basically saying like, what's going on at period t in terms of thing, the economic condition, as well as underlying economic behavior of the subjects that are still in the state as of state t. So you want to kind of condition on the sample for those who are still around. So theoretical predictions about a duration distribution thus run by way of a hazard of that distribution. It's obvious that the if the completion of a spell is at least partly affected by external conditions that change over time, and if one attempts to describe behavior of the subject over time in a changing environment, then it is easier to think about the rate of leaving at period t, given that one has not done so, than to focus on the unconditional rate of leaving at period t. So what he means by that is it's much easier to talk about the hazard rate than to talk about f of y, for example. f of y is kind of the natural unconditional statistical, um, and that's what will sort of show up in the likelihood once we write down the, the maximum likelihood problem. But the hazard rate is much more economically intuitive. And so we think about f of y conditional on the survival rate as a consequence. The other things that it does is not just that it sort of maps well to theory, but it's, you know, it's often stated that a major advantage of the hazard function as a basic building block is it facilitates the inclusion of time varying covariates, as we'll discuss in a second, it's kind of much more natural to put things that change over time in a hazard model, like to, at period t, you have covariate t, uh, x that changes at time t, than it is in some um, cross-sectional model where we just put down the duration. How do you think about 
um, things that change over time in that. We'll, we'll talk about that again in just a second. Um, basically, if you're thinking as a builder of a reduced form model, things that are time varying, a duration model is much easier, a hazard model is much easier to have things that change over time. And then from a practical standpoint, censoring is much more easily dealt with in a duration model than it is um, in these other settings. And so that's kind of already something we talked about. But so really the kind of, if you want to make an argument for why do you do um, a hazard model, there's three things. One, it maps to a model that you have in mind. Two, it effectively captures time varying characteristics. Three, it de deals with the right censoring problem. So. Imagine that people move houses because of life events. So I'm not proposing any economic model. I just need that the, the, the life events randomly arrive at some random rate theta t. And so then you have some theta t times dt that is the expected um, life events in a short period of time. So for now, let's assume it's constant. So we have some theta. Then, as you might imagine and remember from your economic models, that if you have some constant arrival rate of hazard rate of things happening, then that that basically makes your um, these life events to be exponential. So the house moving is going to occur at this exponential rate with a mean one over theta, where the density is this exponential function, and we have this CDF of one minus the exponent one minus e to the minus um, theta y. So this distribution is obviously nice. This is why all our economic models have it because it has this lack of memory property, which is just that even you know irrespective of when you censor. Um, the probability um, that, oh, I'm sorry, this, I don't think this is right, but, you know, the, the, the probability that you're going to, uh, it should be y is greater than c in this, not y is greater than zero, that basically the censoring aspect makes it so irrespective of when you cut off, basically if you look forward, conditional on making it to period time c, the expected value going forward of the remaining thing is one over theta. So it just forgets. It has this lack of memory property. So it forgets about what happened previously. Um, and so it's very easy to impute going forward. Once you fit the model for the previous part, you can kind of impute what's going to go forward because you just have to lump on this extra period. So the hazard rate in this context, by the way, if it's not obvious, is the hazard rate is exactly theta. So the way you can see that right, as you take the density, this is theta of the exponential of minus y theta, take one minus the CDF, that's going to get us the exponential of minus theta y, do this, uh, do the f of y divided by the survival rate, that's going to get us exactly theta. So the hazard rate is exactly theta, that's easy. So that makes a really nice property, right, we have this exact constant number that we need to calculate. And now we can study these other duration cases that we had in um, our previous setting. So consider our data sampling and the likelihood. With our fully observed um, flow sampling, we have this likelihood, and it's really straightforward. I mean, so obviously, if we observed everything and we had no censoring, we don't need uh, to do anything special. We don't have to worry about this. We would just take the average, right? But we can write down the likelihood, and the likelihood is going to be equal to the product of all the densities. So remember, this is no different from when we were doing likelihoods before. Which remember the likelihood, the density is just the hazard rate times the survival function, right? Just mechanically, um, since the hazard rate is equal to the density divided by the survival, same same thing here. And under the exponential, then what we have is we just have this um, this density, and we can we can solve for the maximum likelihood, right? We would take the log, we'd solve, we'd take a derivative with respect to theta, we'd solve. Very straightforward. Um, with right censoring, where we have an indicator di equals 1 if it's censored at some um, ci, and di equals 0 if not, if censored, sorry, di equals 0 if it's censored, and di equals 1 if it's not censored, and we have flow sampling, which means that um, we just observe from the beginning. We don't have this stock sampling problem. Um, then the likelihood is going to be... Uh, you know, we have, remember, it's the hazard function. Oh, sorry, what we have is basically this density aspect to which what we observe is for, um, for some subset of the data that's not censored, we observe the exact one. And then for the other data, what we observe is that um, 
we observe the censoring period. So for this data, what we observe is just that we've made it to period CI for that, for that sample. Where then what that's going to be is that so the, for some subset of the sample, we're going to have the hazard rate and they survived until period YI. And then for the others, we're going to have um, the likelihood is going to be CI to the 1 minus DI for those. Right, so conceptually what it's going to do is it's going to account for the fact that for a subsample of the data, we don't observe all the way to what it goes for. And so what we have to do is we have to account for it with this additional piece of data. And then crucially, what's going to be necessary is that this DI is going to be random. So it's not going to generate, it's not going to be basically biasing our sample in any way. It's not correlated with what YI is. And so it won't inherently... Um, be driving our underlying estimates for what data is once we account for that in our full likelihood. Basically, an important thing to note, though, is that ignoring the censoring, even if the censoring is random, is going to bias your estimate of theta. So there's kind of two ways one could naively ignore it, right? Is you just say, all right, let's toss any data that's censored, or you could treat um, the censoring as real data. And in both cases, they're going to give you overestimates of theta. Um, so I'm going to show you in the exponential case for this. So to see this intuition, let um, ti equal the minimum um, of uh, the two, right? So this is going to be what we observe. So for the basically, it's the true value for any of them that are not censored. And if it's censored, it's going to be equal to ci. That gives us this likelihood here. This is just... All it does is collapse our survival likelihoods in here. Now we're going to have the hazard function. We're going to um, toss in uh, the likelihood function. And so the MLE under that setting is going to be equal to, um, the theta hat is going to be equal to the average censoring divided by the observed T bars. That's basically what, if you model this so, um, using the hazard function, or excuse me, the exponential, what you're going to get then is you're going to basically get, you can solve for that you plug in for the hazard rate under both of these. So let me just, for the purposes of this, you can see it. Um, remember that the, the likelihood under the scenario is going to be equal to the hazard rate under the, um, it's going to be this for, um, it's going to be constant, remember, because it's the exponential, and then it's going to be um, uh, the exponential of uh, negative yi theta for all of them, for the survival rate, and then you can do the log likelihood for this, and just so that you guys have seen this one, the log likelihood of this, remember, is going to be the sum of um, di log of theta plus or well, it would be minus, because it's a minus yi theta. And ba oh, sorry, it won't be yi, because this is now ti, remember. So ti, you'll take the derivative with respect to theta in order to get the MLE. And what that's going to get you is it's going to get you that theta hat is equal to the sum over the di divided by the sum over the ti, they're going to have, you know, you can put n's, divide by n's, that's why I put the bar. So it'll be the average number um, that are not censored uh, divided by kind of the average time that you observe. And so what this is going to do is it's going to scale appropriately for the censoring. And you can think about, well, what would happen if I, if I basically threw out data or I mislabeled the censoring? So if I ignored the censoring and I just estimated as if these were the true values, then remember that this would just go to one. And you, so basically this denominator wouldn't change, but this would get uh, bigger. And so you have upward bias in your estimate. And what would happen if you ignored the data is, or excuse me, if you threw out the data, so basically uh, drop the censored observations, then what you'll get is you'll get the same exercise. Remember, we're going to have less observations now. So, because really what will happen is, is that the numerator will be 1, 
but you'll be dividing the bottom by the number of observations that are uncensored. So it'll be really look like this. And then you'll have um, this. You'll basically be dividing by the sum of the ones that are not censored. Note that basically the denominator will decrease because inherently these ones always have to be weakly smaller than the censoring point, And the numerator doesn't change. And so as a consequence, that's going to create upward bias in your estimate. So, you know, so far in what we've talked about, this is the basically the value here has been um, to create basically add parametric structure to basically capture univariate features of the duration. So we want to know the properties of a censored random variable. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, we want to know the effect of some variable, right? So some treatment D. So, you know, first, let's just think about, well, what are the downsides of running a regression like what this, this Y on D, right? So, you know, for one thing, this D variable is going to be like the average, even if there's no censoring. So what will it capture? It will capture kind of the average effect in the population. It might be, though, that there's kind of a more useful measure where you want to you have a you have a model in which you want to talk about um, kind of the rate at which people exit. Uh, that might be more effectively captured by just doing a duration model. Obviously, that has parametric aspects. So it's, you know, this beta here is just going to capture an average treatment effect, even if there's no censoring issues. Um, but maybe you want something that's a little more mapped to, um, to the model that you have in mind. That's not a great argument it's on its own. There are ways to kind of transform this beta in a way that will be meaningful. Um, but it can be more, you know, that that there are good reasons to potentially want to actually understand the underlying hazard function of what it looks like. Um, kind of the second point is that how do you think about time varying characteristics? So like take this regression here, right? And you're interested in how long are um, people going to be doing something? Imagine you had a menu of things that changed over time. So time varying characteristics. So think about like the minimum wage schedule changing over some time period, or you have um, a basically a schedule of um, unemployment benefits. So if there's step downs and kind of how much benefit you get, you want to capture that in here, but that's not really captured in this type of regression, right? This is a cross-sectional regression in what we've described. And so it's not, there's not a great way to meaningfully characterize that in here. Whereas what you actually want to capture is the kind of the change in the minimum wage and how that changes dynamically. Um, the uh, the hazard to change in a particular um, time period, and then of course you know we already talked about this. This simple linear regression doesn't deal with censoring well. A really simple thing um, to think about though is that you know in this binary case, it's kind of really what you're going to be doing in a lot of cases is you just want to understand well what does it look like in the control group? What does it look like in the treatment group? That's what we were doing. Remember when we were thinking about non-parametric estimation of the average treatment effect. Well, you could imagine in these hazard settings, you know, if you want to understand the hazards in the control group versus in the treatment, just think about this hazard problem for each subset. If it's randomly assigned, those are going to give you counterfactuals, and then you can compare the two of them. So it's very straightforward to think about those um, in the binary case. Very quickly before I kind of jump into the what we actually do in the hazard setting is, you know, a simple a kind of I want to defend the idea of using linear regression in this setting in part because, you know, I think it, it can be very transparent and it's kind of a very natural thing to do as a first thing. Hazard modeling is very tightly linked to economic models, but it can feel non-transparent in part because all, there's a lot of nonlinear things going around and you may worry that there's kind of specification things that you're doing to try to fit the models and maybe it feels um, more black boxy than linear regression does. You know, there are ways in which simple linear regression can address censoring. So if censoring is the first order issue you're worried about, you know, there are ways to kind of deal with this, right? So you take an indicator and you say survive to year K, where year K is just as long as it's not a censored, it's not in the censored range, then, you know, even if years afterwards are censored, you know that they survived at least until that time period. And so those indicators are still going to give you, if you're interested in treatment effects on surviving until a particular time period, linear regression will work fine in that setting. It doesn't deal 
it doesn't sort of it's not really biased as a consequence of the centering. And similar point as we talked about with these univariate settings with quantile regression, um, or for thinking about the quantiles of underlying CDF, the same point exists for thinking about quantile regression. So these graphs, remember, where I talked about the the CDFs here over time, remember that this is analogous to when we were talking about quantile treatment effects, where if these were not purchase years, but rather one was a treatment group and one was a control, we could talk about the differences in a particular quantile, and that would be exactly the quantile treatment effect that we have in mind. So there are very meaningful ways to kind of address this in a simple linear setting that don't require anything complicated. Um, I think it's possible to do a kind of a number, a combination of things to do a number of robust analyses. I would kind of recommend that any hazard modeling kind of, if you can support it with a simple linear regression to kind of highlight where the kind of the rubber meets the road, that can be really valuable. Um, I think that it's really important for linear regression to kind of be very aware of the data sampling process. Um, another thing that we just talked about though is that it also really does a poor job of of dealing with this time varying covariates problem. And so hazard modeling will very naturally address that. So what do people do in hazard modeling? So I'm not gonna get too much into the weeds of it. It's really all, we're gonna put a stronger parametric form on this. We're gonna, there's basically a kind of a more convoluted um, uh, likelihood method you need to do in order to address these. I'm gonna kind of give you the high level way of doing it. These are all kind of canned routines that exist in um, in standard software packages, but you know what is these are basically the workhorse models that people use, which is um, proportional hazard models. They're actually called the kind of the high level ones are these mixed proportional hazard models. The Cox proportional hazard model is what kind of almost everyone knows, and what that is is that what you do is you model the hazard as being the following. So for any given individual, well. For any individual with characteristics X, the hazard at period T, so theta at period T given characteristics X, is equal to some baseline hazard phi times some theta zero of X. So theta zero is usually what it is, is some you know exponentiated X beta, where so that's ensuring that this is always positive. And these are multiples of each other, so they're multiplicative. So the idea is that there's an underlying baseline hazard that's the same for everyone. That can be non-parametrically estimated. And the idea is that, well, that's not going to require anything other than kind of just trying to understand the shape of it and looking at the underlying data. And with that hazard, you also are going to allow for the idea that the characteristics are going to shift around the level of the hazard curve, but not gonna change the overall shape. So the key point is, is that theta zero isn't a function of time directly, but it can change through things that change over time. So hopefully this is clear that like, you know, this is really, we're allowing this to kind of change with time. This is like putting in time dummies in that the sense that the level of it shifts just as a function of what time period it is. But the shape of it doesn't change directly as a function um, of people. People don't have their own different um, baseline hazard. But it can change over time for different individuals. The shape of it can change if the characteristics of those people change. So remember how we were talking about, say we want to capture time varying characteristics. Those can change in X. X is allowed to vary over time. But they don't, it's not, you don't put that actual time effects in. So this is kind of the base, this is kind of the workhorse, the Cox proportional hazards model, which is a subset of this um, mixed proportional hazards model, which looks hopefully exactly the same, except what you now have is this scalar V, which multiplies the hazard rate. And V is allowed to vary over people. The special case that you can imagine, right? So the special case is that V is equal to one. That gets you back to the Cox model. And what it's going to do now is that this, Obviously now, underlying heterogeneity, some people are going to be more likely to exit than others. So V is allowed to be differing across individuals. And so, you know, what I think is really valuable is to just understand why the hazard rate could be time varying or it could be unobserved heterogeneity. So why is it you care about this sort of thing? So 
simple way to think about this comes from Lancaster is to think about, all right, so there's two types of people in the world. There's movers and stayers. Movers have some sh share of the population P and stayers have some share of the population one minus P. And the movers have a theta of um, two. So they're, they're much more likely uh, to um, have a high hazard rate. And the stairs are going to have a low hazard rate. And so what can happen, right, is that the share of each of the remaining population is going to change and shift over time. Basically saying that um, what's going to happen is that the overall hazard rate is going to change as a consequence of there's less and less stairs, uh, movers in the population and more and more, um, sorry, there are less stairs in the population, movers in the population, sorry, less movers in the population than more stairs. So the average of the group is going to shift, the composition is going to shift more and more towards stairs. And so the hazard rate is going to shift, but it's a composition it's a compositional impact of unobserved heterogeneity. We don't know how to measure who are movers and stairs, but this shifts over time. And so, you know, there are ways to kind of directly address this if you only see one set of um, observations. So Lancaster tries to model this and allow for unobserved heterogeneity to kind of capture these differences. There are also kind of more modern techniques that can potentially address this issue that are basically going to exploit panel data, right? So if you observe multiple spells and then as assume that people are movers in both both um, spells, then that you can basically uh, exploit that cross spell variation to kind of get at this. Um, um, oh, I got the baby. Yep, that's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause.